So the parabolic heat, heat conduction equation can actually be solved in two dimensions or actually even in three dimensions, but we're not going to go to three here, but, but we'll, we'll move to two at least to, to get a little bit of an idea uh, of what's going on. So we have this, the partial of, of temperature with respect to time is equal to K, second partial of T with respect to X. So this is what we had before and all we did, well, I like, I'd like to get a different color here. All we did was added on this second term here. This is a new term, it's another spatial dimension. Uh, first of all, uh, the first question that might come up is in trying to classify this differential equation. You say, hey, this isn't a parabolic equation because look, we have a second partial here, we have a second partial here, um, and, and so those are gonna be, those are gonna be our, uh, our, our A and C, and they're both positive, and so we're not gonna, when we're doing B squared, minus 4ac they're both going to be positive and so we're not going to have we're not going to have zero here that doesn't work this isn't a parabolic equation well uh, actually it is a parabolic equation and the one thing that that is going to throw a wrench in the works and help you see why it wasn't as simple as as maybe you thought yeah sure when this was equal to zero it was it was it was uh, an elliptic equation but right here we have the partial of t with respect to time okay you notice here that we don't have uh, a function of, so this isn't just two independent variables. We have three independent variables, right? We have time, we have x, and we have y. Everything that I wrote out before was just for time, uh, well, not necessarily for time, it was just for two uh, independent variables. Well, what happens if we have three? Well, so I'm not going to get too much into this, but I think it was it's worth exploring a little bit because this is really confusing if you don't. Um, what we have is you can define a second order operator. So you, you sort of generalize this idea of a partial derivative, and 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 there's something called a second order elliptic um, operator, um, and that is is what we do here. And it's actually the um, we can just use del squared. So this would be k del squared t, um, uh, the partial of t uh, with respect to t is equal to k del squared t, right? And and this is this is the spatial uh, derivative. This is a partial derivative um, with respect to space. So if it's one dimensional, then it's just the partial of t, the the second partial of t with respect to x. That's all this comes out to be. If there's two dimensions, it comes out to be the second partial of t with respect to x and with respect to y. Um, and if there's a third dimension, uh, you can go on. And, and this is all treated as one term in this b squared minus 4ac when you're trying to evaluate it. This is all treated as one term, and so it could be treated as an a or a c. There's no distinguishable difference between the two. But then you've only got one second order term. So it is actually, uh, and then our second, uh, and so you can treat all of this as really just one um, this both this x and the y you can treat it really as just one um, one independent variable in a sense uh, and then and then we have the partial of t with respect to t here so then we we you can think of it as having two two separate um, independent variables and then all of the the intuition that we had before applies. Okay, so that's just a little bit of a sidetrack so you, so you know this is a, a parabolic equation. Um, now, it, there's there's several things that happen. We're, we're looking at a lot more computations when we move into two dimensions. Uh, okay, the other thing is our, well, so so in particular we have the explicit methods that we, we've talked about before. We're just going to motivate what we're going to do here. We have the explicit and the implicit methods that we've talked about. What was the big disadvantage of the explicit methods? The big disadvantage of the explicit methods was the stability criterion. The stringent stability criterion. And it turns out it doesn't get any better in this case. It actually gets worse. The stability, in this case, it's required that T is or the delta t is less than or equal to one eighth um, delta x squared plus delta y squared all over 
k. So this is not good. <laughs> okay, this is not good. This makes it um, even even more stringent, and so the the amount of computation that's going to be required by uh, the explicit approaches is is extremely high. Uh, the implicit scheme uh, this is this is fine, uh, like Crank Nicholson, right? Crank Nicholson, which we just learned, Nicholson. You think, well, we could just apply Crank Nicholson, and and that's just no problem. Well, the problem with with uh, Crank Nicholson in 2D is 2D is our system is not uh, tri diagonal. And we got all this computational advantage from having to solve every time we did the Crank Nicholson method in, two, in 1D, uh, we were solving just a tri diagonal system, and so that was great. But now, um, in 2D, it's not tri-diagonal anymore, and we have to solve this whole thing, and it's really, um, it's ugly, and it's not computationally efficient. So you say, okay, what do we do? What are we going to do uh, to deal with this? Well, uh, the solution that, that we've come up with is called the ADI scheme, which stands for alternating, alternating, um, direction implicit. So right from the name, uh, you get the idea that it, it is an implicit approach. So good, we're sticking with, with the, the trusty uh, implicit approach, this alternating direction implicit approach. And uh, the other thing that we need to know about this is this alternating direction business. Now, let me go clear out some space and, uh, and excuse me, let me go clear out some space and I'll draw some stuff uh, to, to show you. All right, so I've, I've written some of this out here and, and we're not going to go too deep into this, but, but we need to see, uh, I, want, I really want you to see how it works. So, um, if you write out the equations for, remember I mentioned that the Crank-Nicholson um, method doesn't yield in general, it doesn't yield tri-diagonal systems to solve at each step, so it might be extremely inefficient uh, at each step to solve a, a general system of equations. However, what happens is is the you can uh, have a tri-diagonal system of equations if you if you solve this in a certain way. In particular, what happens is if you go, for example, and I solve and I solve in this direction, okay, then I come back around here and I solve in this direction again, right? This is come back around, solve in this direction again. Then for that iteration, for that pass, everything was everything was tri-diagonal and so it works out. Then, uh, when you're going to go through it again and, and step forward in time and, and uh, propagate your solution uh, forward in time to, to, to do again, which is um, what you have to do when you're solving this type of system, remember, because time, uh, time moves on and that's what we're trying to do is get the solution for a whole bunch of different time points. The next time through, you have to go through in the other direction and then you come back around and you go through in the other direction here and you go through back in the other direction here. Now this is actually really interesting how it turns out and then you have to go back uh, to this other approach and, and you switch back and forth. So this is why it's called the alternating direction and it is an implicit method. So it's called alternating direction implicit and it gets its name because of how you go through um, the order here. And the whole reason we do that is so that we have a more uh, efficient matrix to solve. Yeah, sure, when it's only 3 by 3 or 4 by 4, it's no big deal. But when you have a large matrix, it makes a big difference uh, if it's if it's got a nice tridiagonal structure or something or not. So that's that's the gist of the alternating uh, direction implicit method, which is the method that we use uh, for solving parabolic heat conduction equations, uh, the, the heat conduction in, in two spatial dimensions. There are other, the, there's more general techniques are called uh, uh, splitting methods and they, there's, 
you know, all kinds of nitty gritty little details that you have to get into to try to overcome certain disadvantages of the alternating direction implicit method. Uh, but uh, it's nice to be aware of this uh, method for solving uh, partial differential equations with um, with two spatial uh, the elliptic partial differential, excuse me, parabolic partial differential equations in uh, two spatial.